Hello. And today we're going to read a story of the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Um, looking through this book, I have found out there's 81 pages of introduction. But literally. Wow. <laughs> Baby has been having some trouble falling asleep recently, so I decided to. I re brought this book to record and hopefully find some comfort in. No. Part 1 The Humiliated Apprentice Tales. Book 1 Eurocrates and Pancrates. This story took place in 170 CE. Lucian of Samosata. I will tell you, Eurocrates said, another incident derived from my own experience, not from hearsay, perhaps even you, Tyakides, when you have heard it, may be convinced of the truth of the story. When I was living in Egypt during my youth, my father had sent me traveling for the purpose of completing my education. I took it into my head to sail up to Kopotos and go from there to the statue of Memnon, in order to hear it sound that marvelous salutation to the rising sun. Well, what I heard from it was not a meaningless voice, no. As in the general experience of common people, Menon himself actually opened his mouth and delivered an oracle to me in seven verses. If it were not too much of a discretion, I would have repeated the very verses for you. But on the voyage up the river, a man from Memphis chanced me to be sailing with us. He was one of the scribes of the temple, wonderfully learned, familiar with all the culture of Egyptians. He was said to have lived underground for 23 years in their sanctuaries, learning magic from Isis. You mean Pancrates, said Aragonatus. My own teacher, a holy man, clean-shaven, in white linen, always deep in thought, speaking in perfect Greek, tall, flat-nosed, with protruding lips and thinnish legs. Yes, that self-same Pancrates. And at first I did not know who he was, but when I saw him working all the sorts of wonders whenever we anchored the boat, particularly riding on crocodiles and swimming in the company of the beasts, while they fawned and wagged their tails. I recognized that he was a holy man, and, by degrees, through my friendly behavior, I became his companion and associate, so that he shared all his secret knowledge with me. At last, he persuaded me to leave all my servants behind in Memphis, and to go with him quiet, alone, for we should not lack people to wait on us, and thereafter we got on in that way. But whenever we came to a stopping place, the man would take either the bar, the door, or the broom, or even the pedestal, and put clothes upon it, say a certain spell over it, and make it walk, appearing to everyone else to be a man it would go off and draw water, and buy provisions, and prepare meals, and in every way, deafly serve and wait upon us. Then, when he was through with his services, he would again make the broom a broom, or the pest a pest, by saying another spell over it. Ooh. <laughs> Though... I was very keen to learn this from him. I could not do so, for he was jealous, although most ready to oblige and everything else. But one day I secretly overheard the spell. It was just three syllables, and by taking my stand in a dark place, he went off to the square after telling the pestle what it had to do. And on the next day, while he was transacting some business in the square, I took the pestle, dressed it up in the same way, said the syllables over it, 
and told it to carry water. When it had filled and brought in the jar, I said, Stop! Don't carry any more water. Be a pestle again. But it would not obey me now. It kept straight on carrying until it filled the house with water for us by pouring it in. At my wit's end over the thing, I feared that Pancrates might come back and be angry. And, as was indeed the case, I took an axe and cut the pestle in two. But each part took a jar and began to carry water, with the result that instead of one servant, I now had two. I want to look up what pestle means. Thank you for waiting for this information. We will now answer what a pestle is. Ah, uh, a pestle is what they used in relation to a mortar to grind up things in the bowl. It was basically just a grinding tool. Not too big, not too small. Now you see the direct relation is to the sorcerer's apprentice. Let's continue on, shall we? Meanwhile, Pancritus appeared on the scene and, comprehending what had happened, turned them back into wood again, just as they were before the spell. But then for his own part, left me to my own devices without warning, taking himself off out of sight somewhere. Then you still know how to turn the pestle into a man, said Dinomachus. Yes, said he, only halfway, however, for I cannot bring it back to its original form, for it once becomes a water carrier. But we shall be obliged to let the house be flooded with water that is poured in. Will you never stop telling such bonkame, old men as you are, said Thycades. If you will not, at least for the sake of these lads, put your amazing and fearful tales off to some other time, so that they may not be filled up with such terrors and strange figments before we realize it. You ought to be easy with them, and not accustom them to hear things like this, that will abide them and annoy them in their lives and will make them afraid by every sound, by filling them with all sorts of superstitions. And that was Eurydice and 